Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Today I'm excited to show off a new Android build for Ambernic RG353 devices. And this is a custom build made by the developer Black Seraph. And I've showed off their work before in other videos. They make these custom Android builds that are really sharp. And this one here is also really well made. In addition to having the option to add the Google Play Store, they've also added some nice functionality like easy access to swap out your ABNXY buttons. In addition, they've retained some features like the original Ambernic key mapper too. And this custom build is going to work on any of the RG353 devices. That includes the 353V right here, but then also the 353P and the 353M. And I've been testing this for the past few days on all of these devices here, and it's been working great. And so in this video, we're going to do a few things. Number one, we're obviously going to install this Android build, but then I also want to show off some of the key features that I like the most. And then we're also going to do some performance tests to compare this against the Google Play Store version, as well as the one without Google Play Store. And we'll also see how certain systems perform against the custom Linux firmwares that are available for these devices as well. We got a ton of ground to cover, so without any further delay, let's jump right into it. Okay, to start, let's talk a little bit more about Black Seraph. Like I mentioned before, they've made these custom Android builds for several devices. Personally, I've used the Ambernic RG552 build as well as the one for the Palkitty X18S. In addition, just a few months ago, they made a really unique streaming service called Castor, and I made a video about that as well. Now to access these beta files for the Android builds, you need to be a Patreon member. And it is the $10 a month tier that's gonna unlock all those files for you. Now you don't have to subscribe for a bunch of months. You can really just pay for that one single month and then download all those files right there. And so while you're in there, you can grab the other files for the RG552 or test out Caster if you'd like as well. And you can use this same build for multiple devices. So for example, I downloaded it once and then I flashed it onto three different devices and it worked great. Anyway, once you download all the files, they're gonna look like this. They are seven zip files in a sequential order. What you want to do here is unzip the one that doesn't have a number after the seven zip file extension. And so to do this, I'm going to right click here, go to seven zip and then select extract here. After that, you'll have two different files. One is a readme file with all the instructions and then the other one is an update file with the actual image. From there, you can delete the other seven zip files. You're not going to need them anymore. And to start, let's go ahead and flash that image to an SD card. I'm going to use an app called Bolena Etcher. I'm going to navigate to that update file and then add it here. I'm also using a 16 gigabyte micro SD card. And once that's set up, you're going to hit flash. It's going to ask, do you really want to do this? And you say, yeah, man, I want to do it. It'll take a couple minutes to flash onto the SD card, but when it's done, it'll let you know. And at that point, Belena Etcher will actually eject the SD card for you. So all you have to do is pull it out of your computer and then plug it into your Ambernic RG353 device. For this, you want to put it in the first micro SD card slot and you want to take any card out of the second slot as well. After that, all you have to do is power on the device and it'll immediately start updating the Android version. This process will take between five and 10 minutes altogether. So go grab a cup of coffee. Additionally, just to be safe, I would recommend plugging it into a power source so that the battery doesn't die during the installation process. Anyway, once it's done, you'll get a wall of text like this and it'll say eject the SD card. And literally that's all you have to do. Eject the SD card and the device will restart into that new version of Android. And so here we are. It's going to give you three different options for your default home app. The one called Quick Step is just going to be your regular old Android browser, but you can also set it up so that it'll launch directly into the Daijisho front end. Additionally, Black Seraph has added another feature, which is pretty cool, and that is it'll just launch any single app that you want. And so, for example, if you wanted to have your Android device boot directly into RetroArch, you could do that right here. Or maybe you're only going to use it for something like Xbox Game Pass. You could do that as well. Anyway, for now, we're just going to choose the Quick Step one to give you that regular Android interface. And as you can see right here, it is very bare bones. You've got your Settings and Files app, and then you have Daijisho, and then another one that just launches a single app. And that's really about it. And the fact that it's bare bones is a really good thing. That means it's going to reduce the amount of overhead here that's going to eat up your RAM. A couple other nice features. If you tap the function button, it's going to bring up the Ambernic key mapper. This will be great if you're playing a game that doesn't have built-in controls. You can map them right here. Additionally, if we swipe down from the top, we have a customized menu. Within here, we can do things like adjust the brightness as well as set the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Additionally, we have the option here to adjust the layout of the A, B, and X, Y buttons. And so you can either have them Nintendo style like they are in the physical buttons, or you can set it up for an Xbox layout so that the B button is your confirm button. That's personally the one that I like to use. 
Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about your options when it comes to loading apps on this specific version of Android. Like I mentioned in the intro, you do have the option to install Google Play Store. And we're gonna do that here in a second, but let's go over some of these features. Number one, it's gonna give you really easy integration when it comes to downloading and installing your apps, just like it would with any other Android device. In addition, you can make or restore in-app purchases very easily. Additionally, if you wanna play an app that requires Google Play services, which includes a lot of games, then you have that option here. However, all these features do come at a cost, and that is going to be a higher overhead. By virtue of having the Play Store and other Google service apps running at the same time, that means you will have some reduced performance compared to if you just added the apps one at a time. And we'll test that performance here in a bit. Now the other option here is side loading, and typically I don't recommend this because it can cause issues when it comes to installing apps, but hear me out here because there are some compelling reasons why you may want to go this route anyway. Number one, I recommend using the Aurora Store, and I'll show you how to install that here in a second as well. This app will allow you to sign in with your Google profile, and then you can restore any of your purchases made previously. And so for example, if you wanted to install the Drastic app, if you log in with your Google profile, you can restore that purchase. And also because Aurora Store is basically just a means to sideload your apps, that means you're not gonna have any overhead like you would with Google Play Store. And so if you go this route, the Android interface will actually feel a lot more snappy than if you had the Google Play Store. Now there are some negatives for going this route. For example, you can't restore your in-app purchases. For example, with the Redream emulator, if you've already purchased the premium version via an in-app purchase, you won't be able to unlock that. But at the end of the day, that's not really that big of a deal for this particular device because it only has a 480p screen anyway. And so yeah, you won't be able to unlock the higher resolutions, but you can't use them anyway. The bigger rub here is going to be that you won't have any Google Play services. And so if there are certain apps or games that you wanna use that require that, you will run into some issues. And so it's really going to be up to you which route you want to go, but the nice thing here with this Android build is that you have that choice. And so let me show you real quick how to install each of these methods. We'll start with the Google Play Store. To start, I would recommend opening up that README file that came with your installation files. And in here, it'll walk you through this entire process. In a nutshell, you want to download two apps, the Magisk app and then also one that has Google Apps. To do this, you can just follow the URLs that are in that README file here. And so once you've downloaded Magisk from GitHub and then the Light Gaps one from Source, SourceForge, you're good to go. And this is what these two apps will look like right here. Next, you wanna use a USB-C cable to connect it from your PC over to your RG353. And you're gonna plug this into the power port, not the OTG one. After that, your computer should immediately recognize the device. It's gonna think it's a Google Pixel 3. This was done on purpose by Black Serif to make sure that everything works properly. Either way, when you open this up, you can access the internal shared storage. And then what I would do is just drag those files into your downloads folder. And this will take just a few seconds, but after that, you're good to go. And so next, we're gonna go into the files app and install them. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky. You're actually going to see those files directly on that front page, but if you click on them, it's not going to install the file. Instead, you have to do a bit of a workaround. So you have to go into that left menu here, then select the Pixel 6, then the Downloads folder, and then from there you can install the Magisk app. And all you have to do here is just select the APK. It's going to ask you, do you really want to do it? And then you say, yeah, man, I want to do it. After it's done installing, go ahead and open the Magisk app. And it's going to give you a warning here that it needs to reboot and finish the installation process. And so as you've guessed it, go ahead and let it do that process. Now, once that's done, we have the Magisk app on our device. Next, when we open it up, you're going to want to go onto the far right. And there's a little icon here called modules. Go ahead and tap on that and then select install from storage. Luckily, this will go directly to your downloads folder. And then you can grab that other other Google Apps file that we downloaded. From there, you can just wait a minute. It's going to install all those apps. You don't have to do anything here. After a bit, it's going to show a little reboot button here on the bottom right. Just go ahead and tap on that. And so this is going to reboot the device. And when you open it back up, you can see right here, you have the Google Play Store. From here, you can go ahead and open up the app and then log into your Google account and start downloading your apps just like you would on any other phone or a tablet. And so this is a very clean and safe way of getting the Google Play Store directly on your device. And so now let's talk about installing the Aurora store. And this is super easy as well. We're gonna to go to the Aurora website and then grab the store file right here. From there, you're gonna transfer that file onto your device in the same way that we did with the Google Play Store ones, just via USB-C connection. And then same process here, you're gonna to have to go into the left menu and then go into the Pixel 6 here, then the downloads folder, and then you'll find it right there. Next, go ahead and tap on it. It's gonna ask, do you really wanna install it? And you say, yes. From there, you can go ahead and open up the app and then go through the setup process. And during that process, 
process, it'll give you the option to log in with your Google account. And so if you do that, when you come across a paid app that you've already purchased previously and you're signed into that Google account, you can go ahead and restore that purchase right here. Now, of course, most of the emulators also have a free version of the app. And so if you don't want to log into your Google profile, you can just install them this way as well. And really that's about it when it comes to the Aurora store. The only thing that's limiting about it is without Google Play services, some of these apps aren't going to work properly. And like I mentioned before, you can't restore your in-app purchases within the apps either. But for all the functions, it works great. And so now let's do a quick test between two devices, one that has Google Play Store installed and one that doesn't. And we're gonna run the same game through the same app at the same part of the game as well. And so listen to the audio stuttering here between these two games so you can see that one is slower than the other. And so as you can see here, yes, the one without the Google Play Store is about five to 10 frames per second faster than the one with it. And so if you really wanna get the best performance possible in Android, you may wanna go the Aurora Store route. Now in general, it's very hard to get this game running at full speed anyway within this chipset. And so the fact that it's stuttering here shouldn't be used as an indication that Nintendo 64 doesn't work very well. For example, I would say about 90% of Nintendo 64 games run at full speed using this app, especially if you're going to use the Android without the Google Play Store. And so some of those classics like F-Zero X or Paper Mario or Mario 64, absolutely no problem here. Now, in addition, this app has a lot of features that you can't find on Linux either. For example, you could do things like game-specific button mapping or change out your emulation profile per game. Some of those things are possible within RetroArch, but not the standalone Nintendo 64 emulators on Linux, which run better than RetroArch anyway. And so if you want to have the most features available for Nintendo 64, I would recommend using the Android one over Linux. Now in terms of performance, they're about the same. I would say Linux is a little bit slower, but not by much. For example, here's a little bit of Cruisin' USA running on Arc OS. So yeah, at the end of the day, Cruising USA is probably not going to work on this chipset very well, but most of the other Nintendo 64 games will work just fine. And so in the end, I think it's going to be up to you whether or not you want to add Google Play Store or not. If you do add it, it's going to give you a wider range of access to Android games like Horizon Chase Turbo. But just bear in mind, it is going to come at a performance cost for everything that you're running within Android. Another feature that Black Sara fixed with this custom Android build is that he fixed the shoulder and trigger buttons when it comes to game streaming. And so now the gamepad does register as an Xbox 360 controller. That means if you want to do Xbox cloud gaming or local game streaming for Xbox or PlayStation, it'll work fine. All of these shoulder buttons are going to be mapped appropriately. Now that being said, I wouldn't recommend playing first person shooter games on the RG353V. It's just kind of an awkward process. But if you want to play a game like Vampire Survivors that doesn't require shoulder and trigger buttons, this can be a lot of fun. Although bear in mind that playing 16x9 content on a 4x3 screen can get a little bit squinty. Regardless, this is one of the main strengths of using Android here is that the streaming options are much higher. In addition to Xbox and PlayStation streaming, you can use apps like Moonlight or Steam Link as well. One other feature that's super handy is that if you have a game data card from ArcOS or Jealous or even from the stock operating system on Linux, these will all work just fine with the new Android build as well. And so you'll be able to access the same games from the same SD card both on ArcOS or Jealous as well as on Android. Okay, and for this last section here, I want to compare the performance between Android without Google Play Store as well as the Linux custom firmwares. And I'm just going to focus on these systems that don't really play perfectly on Linux to see if we can get them any better on Android. When it comes to PSP, I would say the Android version is a little bit better than on Linux. For example, here with OutRun 2006, we can get it at mostly full speed with 1x resolution and skipping the buffer effects and not having to do any frame skip at all. I'd say about 80 or 90% of the time you will get a full frame rate of 60 frames per second. Meanwhile, the same game and same settings on ArcOS doesn't run as well. I'd say on average this is running about 15 frames per second slower. For some of the easier games to emulate, like Ridge Racer, it works really well here on Android. Here I can use the buffered rendering setting, which will allow the reflections to show correctly on the car. And in some of the more intensive sections, like this section here with the crowd, you can see it's running at a full frame rate the entire time. Cool. 
Meanwhile, for the Linux firmwares, you're going to have to turn on skip buffer effects. This means you won't see the reflections on the car itself, so it looks a little bit worse. In addition, you're going to get more stuttering as well. For example, right here with the crowd, you can see it dip down to about 58 frames per second. And so this is by no means a perfect PSP experience, this chipset really can't handle it. But I found that you will get better performance on Android if you do a little bit of tweaking within the settings. For example with Wipeout Pulse, this one works really well with a frame skip of 1. Moving over to Nintendo DS, I would also recommend using this one on Android as well. To start, the performance is just fine here. You can set it to the high resolution setting and you'll still get a full frame rate. But the main advantage here is the ability to use the touchscreen for Nintendo DS games that require it. And so this one's an easy choice. Between the two, I would pick the Android version here. Now, when it comes to Dreamcast on Android, we're getting a lot more mixed results. When it comes to those easier to emulate games, yeah, they run just fine. And the nice thing here is the ReDream emulator is very accurate too. However, that accuracy can come at a performance cost with some of those harder to emulate games. For example, Sonic Adventure 2 averages about 45 frames per second even with frame skip on. And so to me, I would say this game is unplayably slow. On the opposite end of the spectrum, here is Arc OS running with the default emulator, and as you can see here, it is also using frame skip, but running at full speed. And so when it comes down to it, for an all-around better experience with Dreamcast, I would recommend using a custom firmware like Jealous or Arc OS. And finally, the last system that tends to give people problems is going to be Sega Saturn. Here I'm using the standalone Yabasan Shiro app, and as you can see, we're only getting about 40 frames per second, and this is with frame skip on as well. And so this game is only running at about two-thirds speed. Meanwhile, the same game using the default emulator in Arc OS runs at about 58 frames per second on average. So it's got a tiny bit of slowdown even with frame skip, but this is way more playable than it was on Android. And so, long story short, the results here are pretty mixed. Nintendo 64 is kind of a wash between the two, but you are going to have more features within the emulator and it's going to be more accurate as well. When it comes to PSP and Nintendo DS, I think that Android's going to work better for you there. But as far as Dreamcast and Sega Saturn, I would say stick with the custom Linux firmware. And so this is kind of my daily use setup now here with this new Android build. I'm currently using Arc OS within my RG350 V, and within here I'm focusing mostly on the retro games that I tend to prefer. And so things like Game Boy or Nintendo, Super Nintendo Genesis, things like that, then I'm going to play those on Linux. But say I have a hankering for one of those systems like Nintendo DS or Nintendo 64 that I prefer to play on Android. What I would do here is I would shut down my custom Linux firmware, and then once it's powered off I would just pop out the SD card a little bit. From there, when I power the device back on, it's going to boot into Android instead. And as soon as you see the Ambernic logo here, you can push the SD card right back in. And so we're kind of getting the best of both worlds right here. We have that custom Linux firmware which you can curate to your specific needs, and we have a nice lightweight version of Android available as well with the option to add Google Play Store, and we can also use that nice Digicio front end as well. And so that's really about it for this video. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I'm interested to see if this is going to breathe new life into your RG353 device. As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.